video about the insides of this guitar. And you can see that I'm currently gluing the back on. This is a particular weird technique that I came up with that uh, allows me to do away with about a hundred spool clamps. It goes on much faster, the glue is wet when I put it on, and it actually gives superior glue joints. But that's not really what what the video is about. It's what's on the inside of, of these guitars and why that makes for a, a better guitar. It's mostly going to be talking from the stomach. You'll see that a little bit of one. Just getting ready to put this together and thought we'd take a look at it. Now, if I was a lot younger and I was planning to make a career for the next 40 years, there's no way I would be showing you the details of how I make this guitar. But I'm in my late 60s. I don't know how many more of these I'm going to make. And I'm the only one making these. And I think that having put, you know, 10 to 40 years, depending on how you look at it, into these instruments and the development of them, it's kind of a shame to have them just die out with me. Anyway, this is a double top. I don't know if you can see in there the, the Nomex poking through. It's Nomex all the way to the outside there. There is, you know, there's some balsa inside here under the sound hole and, and under the bridge that makes the glue a, a, a little bit tighter joint than the gnome is able to give. And this is my bracing pattern that I've been using for about two years now. And every one of these instruments has been an outstanding instrument. Now some I might like a little better than others, but they're all really loud, they're even, really good instruments. Now, aside from the bracing pattern, which, yeah, does it matter? There's debate about that as to how much the pattern itself matters. What matters really is that the, the height and the stiffness and everything of the, the braces matches up to the top so that it becomes one very well-functioning unit. Now, the other thing that I've done here, and I don't know if anyone else is doing this, is that I have this suspended brace here that has a single point of contact right in the middle of the sound hole. And this allows the vibration to go up into the sound hole area. Now, historically, guitar makers have been paranoid of this, and they beef up this area because they don't want that to vibrate. I, I've taken the opposite approach, and I say, why the hell not? The reason I say that is that if you look at Cladney patterns for steel string guitars made with X braces, this is a very active area. Why shouldn't it be active in classical guitars? There's no reason that it shouldn't be. And I've yet to hear anyone actually make a compelling case or show me how an unbraced sound hole area actually causes the flutter that everyone seems to be paranoid about. I just haven't seen it. And I've made quite a few that don't have that extra heavy bracing around there. Now I do have some bracing here, partially just to to keep the arch of the top. Now I should mention the arch on the top is biggest here at the waist and that's something that I don't know of anyone else doing. Normally the largest area, you know, depth wise is at the butt of the guitar down in here. Well I don't want sound trapped in there. I want it to come out the sound hole so it makes sense to me to have the widest area here just like the, the bell of a of a horn, they don't have the widest part of the tubing down at the end uh, by the by the uh, area you blow into. They've got it where the sound comes out, and that's what I've done here. Kind of a weird way to describe that, but maybe I'll I'll get some graphics up to show that. So anyway, this frees up this area of the top to vibrate. And, and I have Cladney patterns, and maybe I'll show 
that as well as to how this part becomes part of the overall vibrating area, which it does. Um, lack of Spanish heel sticking into the back, there's no reason that I see for that to exist. However, here, underneath the fretboard, there's a lot of reason to put a big block under there and to make sure that's well secured onto the fretboard because you don't want that fretboard losing energy from being loose on top of a floppy top. It doesn't make sense. So, lots of things there. Notice no block at the end of the body. There's no reason for that. The sides themselves here now are as thick as most blocks that I had put in before. So there's no point in having an end block there. Um, it's, uh, I don't know what else to say about that other than let's look at the back a little bit. Fairly traditional back in the sense that it has three braces. That's very traditional for classical guitars. I am using aromatic red cedar in here. You don't really smell it once the thing's together, but it's a very good wood in terms of, of stiffness and weight and everything else. It's, it's better than spruce in my opinion. Spruce is too weak for the kind of backs that I make. Now the back here is about an eighth of an inch thick. That's a lot thicker than I had done way in the past and, and thicker than most people have, have done backs. I matched this up to a particular thickness of Brazilian rosewood for stiffness and that's what I go with. In this case it happens to be about 3.3, 3.4 millimeters and that's what I'm going with. It's arched. Note the, the rosewood veneer on top of the cross grain strip inside there. That's giving us a, an arch. It's forcing the arch into this wood, which is quite stiff being this thick. So I don't have the label on this yet. I will put that on before I glue this together. Overall, it looks like a really great fit. This is going to be a really nice looking guitar. We'll see how it sounds. I have no reason to doubt that this is going to sound as loud and as full as any of the other guitars I've made in the last two years. None whatsoever. I should mention, just before passing, that this is the neck. It is also maple. The body is European maple. This, this is an American maple here, American soft maple. And it will, of course, be attached once this is all together. There's support underneath the fretboard, although it may be a little thinner than that by the time I'm done. And the fretboard is Mun Ebony. It's a true ebony. It does show some grain. I think it's beautiful. Um, this is actually sometimes even greenish when it's first cut. It turns into a nice dark brown and with finger oil becomes pretty black. So once you actually use it, it works out to where you can't tell the difference. Uh, I think it's, it's a really nice ebony. It's not readily available. In fact, I don't even know where to get any right now. I have a small supply of it that I'll be using up. So, we'll see what this guitar looks like and sounds like in a later video. Thank you.